All right. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, welcome to the uh, Fishbowl Tele Seminar. So our uh, speaker today is Professor uh, Tim Ruffgarden from Stanford University. He got his PhD from Cornell and has been at uh, Stanford ever since. So he works in the general area of the theory of computer science, in particular focusing on game theory and network. Tim has been extremely successful, uh, uh, and his, uh, his work has been cited all over the place. And uh, he's received, for example, uh, uh, starting from an award for his uh, doctoral dissertation to the Presidential Career Award to several ACM awards recently. So so please welcome Tim Ruffgard. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'll bet some speakers find this kind of a weird setup, but uh, as some of you may know, I've been involved in sort of these massive online uh, courses lately, doing algorithms courses and so on. So I have an inordinate amount of sort of recent experience lecturing at inanimate objects in, in empty rooms. <laughs> <laughs> Do the same thing here. Um, so, so when you study game theory, you learn kind of very early and often through examples like The Prisoner's Dilemma and The Tragedy of the Commons uh, that Nash equilibria are generally inefficient. They're suboptimal. So they're not what's called greater efficient. They don't optimize objective functions you might care about, like the welfare of the participants. But uh, there's been a cool counterpoint that's emerged over the past 10 plus years, mostly in the engineering literature, actually, uh, which argues that in many application domains of interest, uh, and under pretty weak conditions, you can prove, even in the worst case, that Nash equilibria are approximately optimal. They're almost as good as what you could achieve if you had full control over a system, full control over a game. And what's become increasingly clear over the past few years is that there's a surprisingly coherent theory behind all of these price of anarchy bounds. Uh, and it's that theory that I, that I want to talk about today. So um, at the beginning of the talk, uh, I want to uh, review what I think of as first generation results on the price of anarchy. So this will be, so we're all on the same page. I'll give you the uh, precise definition, give you some concrete examples to keep in mind throughout the talk. But I want to focus mostly on, on what I think of as second generation results on the price of anarchy, where the main theme is you want guarantees, approximation bounds that hold beyond just the Nash equilibria. And so a couple motivations why you might do that. So one, which I'll talk about at the end if there's time, is games of incomplete information. So this is, for example, auction applications where you're uncertain about what players want. But even in regular old games of complete information, uh, you might want bounds beyond Nash equilibria for robustness reasons. You might want guarantees that do not presume that players reach an equilibrium, but rather apply equally well to much more permissive, uh, much more tractable equilibrium concepts. So that's the plan for the talk. Uh, if there's no questions up front, I'll just sort of uh, jump into the, to the review of the first generation results. And I hope it goes without saying, you know, please uh, feel free to, to interrupt at, other, at, at any time. I do see some faces, but they're about three pixels by three pixels. Uh, so a little more feedback, a little more feedback than, you know, average would be, would be great throughout. So, so, you know, basic questions or, or anything else, I'd be happy to entertain at any time. So any, anyone, anything right now? I think we're good. Okay. So let me say at the outset, the, the theory I'm going to describe is, is uh, quite general, I think. It cuts across many different application domains. But I encourage you for this talk to just think about one application domain as a concrete instantiation. Uh, and I'm going to suggest one that's near and dear to my heart, namely routing games and networks. So I've show, I'm going to show you an example right here on this slide. So this is a game. There's going to be two players. And each of those two players has exactly three strategies namely the paths that go from S to T in this network. You'll notice there are three such directed paths. Now, to finish specifying the game, I have to tell you what the player payoffs are, or equivalently, I'll go ahead and use costs. So each edge of this et, uh, network is labeled with a cost function, and that describes the cost. You can think of it as the delay, uh, as a function of the number X of players that choose a path using that edge. So in this case, because there's two players, X will be either 1 or 0. Now, what the price of anarchy does, it's, it's a comparison between two different outcomes. First of all, the outcome of selfish behavior as defined by a Nash equilibrium, so a stable state from which nobody can improve from a unilateral deviation. And on the other hand, an optimal outcome, what a hypothetical uh, altruistic dictator would implement. So we need to look at both of those two things. Let's start with the Nash equilibrium. So I've set up the game so it's easy to, think, it's easy to figure out what players would do in this game. So over here, this edge with 2x, in the worst case, this is going to have cost 4. That's always better than this thing, which has 5. For the same reason, the 5x, even in the worst case, is always going to be better than the 12. 
So what that means is that both of the players always want to use the path that includes the 2x and that includes the 5x. So in the unique Nash equilibrium, both of the players will use the zigzag path. As a result, both of them will have cost 14. So the joint cost in this outcome is going to be 28. So that's one part of the price of anarchy. The other part is, could we do better with full control over the system? And in this case, we can. We could force the players to not interfere with each other and split along these two two-hop paths. So the green player is still going to have cost 14 just like before, but the red player now has cost nearly 10. So the joint cost is 24 in this case. And the price of anarchy, by definition, is the ratio of these two quantities. So in this particular game, we would say the price of anarchy is 7 over 6. Now, I'm going to be interested in situations where there's potentially lots of equilibria, and we're going to stick to the conservative approach in this talk. We're always going to look at worst-case equilibria, so we'll look at the worst-case equilibrium over an optimal solution, and that's how we'll define the price of anarchy. Now, I hope it's clear that, you know, you can define this quantity, this measure of inefficiency, this, uh, for not just, you know, simple routing games, but really very generally. If you have any kind of game, meaning a set of players, each of whom has a set of strategies, and you've defined payoffs or costs for everybody, when you have a non-negative objective function and some notion of equilibrium, you can look at this ratio. So the protagonist, the numerator, is just the equilibrium performance, or the worst case among all equilibria, when there are many, and the denominator is our hypothetical benchmark, how well we could do with full control over the system. So the very happy scenario is when this ratio equals one. That means every single equilibrium of the game happens to be fully efficient. It means selfish players by themselves just reach an optimal outcome. But, you know, games that you find in the wild, so, for example, when you're thinking about network games, you're not going to expect this ratio to be one. But if the ratio is close to one, then we can conclude, well, you know, even if we had full control over the system, we couldn't do much better. Selfish behavior is actually relatively benign in the event that this ratio is close to one. Now, something which should not be a priori obvious, but which we now have sort of over a decade of experience with, is that there are actually interesting application domains and relatively weak conditions under which this ratio is, in fact, guaranteed to be close to one, under which uh, Nash equilibria are guaranteed to be near optimal. This is true, for example, in all of the popular variants of routing games under weak assumptions. For example, we could describe a routing game model where edges have capacities. So an edge has a capacity, meaning the maximum uh, amount of load that it could tolerate. You could imagine that corresponding to, say, a service rate in some kind of MM1 model. And we could have uh, cost functions on an edge where the cost or the delay shoots off to infinity as the load on that edge approaches uh, the capacity. And something you can prove is that bounded link utilization in a network guarantees bounded price of anarchy. So for example, if you have a network, and I don't care how big it is, I don't care how complicated it is, I don't care what the traffic matrix is, as long as every link utilization is 90% or less, that's enough to conclude, to guarantee that the price of anarchy is at most a factor of two. Of course, in many such instances, it might be even closer to one, but even worst case over all networks, if you can keep the link utilization down at 90% or less, you're almost optimal at equilibrium. So this is something that gives, uh, you know, a theoretical foundation to the, you know, engineering rule of thumb, which was already, in, in, you know, in practice at certain telecoms, uh, as far as I understand, which was that you want to over-provision your network. Of course, one of the reasons you do that is to anticipate future growth in demand, but it was also observed that having extra capacity just made performance metrics better, and this is one explanation uh, for why that's true. So since so this stuff is over 10 years old now, what I've been talking about, and since then, this concept of the price of anarchy has really gone viral. It's been studied by many researchers across all kinds of departments and disciplines and lots of application domains. It's not uncommon. Someone will send me a paper with a title like this, The Price of Anarchy of Healthcare. This was analyzing a, a sort of proposal for decentralization in a UK, health, uh, UK healthcare system. Uh, even things like this. This is a paper from the 2010 uh, MIT Conference on Sports Analytics, and uh, it's, a, it's a cool paper. It uh, draws a metaphor between how a five-person basketball team on the floor might make sort of myopic decisions about what plays to run. It makes a metaphor between that decision-making and equilibria in routing models. 
So if you buy this metaphor, you learn things like, you know, yeah, Kobe Bryant shoots too much, but, you know, hey, it's an equilibrium. Uh, and for those of you that know about Brace's paradox, which is the you know, counterintuitive phenomenon that you can, there are networks where removing the seemingly best edges actually gives you a better equilibrium. It's proposed that that's what's going on when with the Knicks back in the mid 90s, there was this period of time where they actually scored more points than Patrick Ewing, their star center, was on the bench than when he was actually on the floor. The problem was somehow being that all paths went through Patrick Ewing when he was in the game just like the problem with Brace's paradox is that all paths uh, go through sort of some very good edge and lead to too much congestion. So that concludes sort of the, the kind of background, the first generation stuff. So if there are any questions at this point, this would be a, this would be a very natural time. Still good. Okay. So what's been going on in the last few years in this research area? So the goal has been to prove bounds beyond Nash equilibria. And as I said, one motivation is games of incomplete information like auctions. I'll talk about that later if there's time. I want to focus mostly on just games of complete information. So why aren't bounds of, on Nash equilibria good enough in games of complete information? Well, the reason is robustness and tractability. To explain what I mean, let's think about literally what does a bound on the price of energy say? So if you, if you have a game or you have a network or a system and you prove that the price of energy is at most two, what you're saying is provided this network or this system reaches an equilibrium, then you can conclude that its performance is almost as good as optimal. So the concern is that this hypothesis might be a little stronger than we'd like, this hypothesis that a system actually reaches an equilibrium operating point. So why is that a strong hypothesis? Well, first of all, if you're talking about pure Nash equilibria, so these is when players are not allowed to randomize, players deterministically pick actions, then in some application domains that we care about, we're not even guaranteed existence. In the routing games I showed you earlier, we do have existence of pure Nash equilibria, but in other interesting domains, we don't. And then, of course, the price of energy bound would be vacuous. Now, you can look more generally for bounds on all mixed Nash equilibria of a game. Nash's theorem says that mixed Nash equilibria always exist, so it's not vacuous. But mixed Nash equilibria are not always the easiest things to find. And it's a strong assumption to assume that players of a game successfully coordinate on one. There's lower bounds for centralized computation, so-called peak gate completeness results, as well as negative results for the learnability of Nash equilibria. So the concern then is that these price of energy bounds apply to realizations of play, which need not in general be plausible predictions of what the realized play of the game actually is. That's the concern. So what I'm happy to report, and this is going to be the, the main result that I emphasize in this talk, I'm just going to state it informally now, we'll make it precise as we go along, is that there's very good news, which is that uh, a majority, not 100%, but let's say two-thirds or more of the price of energy bounds that have been proved in the literature, again, across many different application domains, are not, in fact, fundamentally about Nash equilibria. The approximation bounds that have been proved hold even if the game is not at Nash equilibrium. That is, even if you have reasonable learners playing the game repeatedly, or roughly equivalently, even if you adopt much more tractable, much more permissive equilibrium concepts. This, is, this holds true for many of the things in the literature. For those of you who have seen talks on the price of anarchy before, there's a good chance that this theorem applies without any quantitative loss to whatever approximation bounds you might have seen people talk about uh, in the past. Okay? So this is the high-level statement I want to focus on. It's, it's definitely not mathematical yet, so let's spend a little bit of time uh, telling, explaining exactly what I mean by this statement. This high-level idea that most known price of energy bounds do not require the game to be at a Nash equilibrium. In fact, the bounds hold under much weaker assumptions about behavior. Before I tell you formally what I mean, let me just say I'm certainly not the first person uh, to, you know, talk about the need for robustness beyond pure Nash equilibria or beyond Nash equilibria. As far as I know, Marachni and Veda were the first to really clearly state that research agenda. That was a very influential paper. Uh, all of the authors on this slide did very nice work last decade. Particularly influential for me was in the bottom right, the Stock 08 paper of Blum, Hajigai, Leggett, and Roth. 
And at this point, most of the results from these papers can be thought of as special cases of the general theory that I'll outline today. So this was the informal statement of the main result I wanted to focus on. Most price of anarchy bounds that are known hold even if you're not at a Nash equilibrium. The first thing I need to make more precise is, well, if I'm not assuming that the system or this game is at a Nash equilibrium, what am I assuming instead? I certainly have to assume something. You can't prove anything interesting about arbitrarily crazy, unrestricted outcomes of games. So the plan is to replace the Nash equilibrium hypothesis with a more permissive equilibrium notion, so a weaker notion uh, of how players play. So what I want to do on this slide is show you a hierarchy of equilibria. And these are all well-known concepts. And uh, the plan is I'm going to start from the smallest set, and then I'm going to move on to bigger and bigger sets uh, of what we might be willing to deem equilibria. Now, before I do that, let's just, you know, be clear on what are the trade-offs as we enlarge the set of equilibria, okay? So as we're willing to deem more and more things equilibria, use a more permissive notion, you know, there's a pro and a con. So the pro is, you know, the bigger the set of things we're calling equilibria, the more plausible it is that the realized play of a game actually lies somewhere in that set. Second, so that's the pro, okay? So the bigger the set, the more likely gameplay is in the set. The con is that, remember, the price of anarchy is by definition a worst case notion. We're seeking approximation guarantees that hold to every single equilibrium. So the more equilibria we have, only the worse the price of anarchy, anarchy bounds will be. So what we're hoping exists is a sweet spot notion of equilibria that's simultaneously big enough to be a plausible description of realized play, yet small enough to admit strong approximation bounds. Okay, so that's the way to interpret the cartoon I'm going to show you on this slide. So the smallest set of interest is just the pure Nash equilibria. So this is exactly what I showed you on slide number two. Each player picks deterministically. And again, the reason we should not be happy with bounds on this set is this set might even be empty. So there's a non-existence critique about bounds that apply to pure Nash equilibria. We can fatten the set to allow players to randomize, and we pick up all of the mixed Nash equilibria. As I said, the set's guaranteed to be non-empty, so that's good. But there's an intractability critique. So it's unclear what it means to prove approximation bounds only on equilibrium outcomes that we don't know how to find in a computationally efficient way. So I'm going to show you now two bigger sets, and some of you may have heard of these. It's okay if you haven't. So correlated equilibria is the next set out. And then the outer set has a bunch of different names. It's sometimes called the Hahnen set. It's sometimes called coarse correlated equilibria. It's equivalent to the empirical distributions of sequences that have no regret. Again, it's OK if you haven't heard of any of those before. Here are the salient properties of these bigger sets. The point is that they elude both the non-existence and the intractability critiques. These sets are so much bigger than the set of mixed Nash equilibria First of all, it's very easy to compute one such equilibrium. For example, even correlated equilibria are, by definition, the feasible solutions to a small set of linear inequalities. So finding one or optimizing over the set just reduces to linear programming. But even better, forget about centralized computation. If you just have all of the players in your game running basically reinforcement learning-like strategies over time, then the joint play, the empirical distribution of joint play, will converge to these sets. And in particular, this outermost set, which is what the theorem is going to be about, even if each player just uses a simple strategy like multiplicative weights or hedge or the perception algorithm, all of those very simple, off-the-shelf, lightweight learning algorithms are sufficient to guarantee convergence of joint play into these bigger sets. Okay? So when I say we're not going to assume a game is at Nash equilibrium, what I'm going to mean instead is we're going to assume that the gameplay is in one of these bigger sets. And the reason that's a big win is because these are much more tractable sets, easy to compute, and easy to learn. Was there a question? I heard a beep. I think somebody joined from outside. OK, no problem. So that's what, so that is formally what we're going to mean by we don't assume that the games are at Nash equilibria. We don't assume that we're in here, which is a very strong assumption about, uh, about player rationality and coordination. We're only going to assume that they're in here. That corresponds to much weaker behavioral assumptions. 
So the second thing that I need to make precise for you is this word most. Okay, so where does that come from? So to make that precise, I'm going to have to tell you a little bit more about why this theorem is true and how it winds up being proved. So let me illustrate sort of how the theorem is going to be proved in using a cartoon. So it's via what I call an extension theorem. An extension theorem is kind of a, a tool for the lazy analyst. And when I say lazy analyst, I'm definitely not excluding the present company. So when you want to prove a bound in the price of anarchy, now on the one hand, you know, as we just discussed, there's really strong motivation. You don't just want to restrict attention to Nash equilibria. You want these much more tractable, much more easy to learn uh, equilibrium concepts like correlated equilibria and beyond. So we want the conclusion of our theorem to apply to all this stuff. You know, on the other hand, you know, if we're the person actually stuck with, with proving one of these things, you know, just take my word for it if you've never thought about this, this topic, it's a lot easier to just say, wow, I really wish I could only focus on the special case of pure Nash equilibria. I don't have to worry about players randomizing. I don't have to worry about correlation amongst their strategies. Really, with pure Nash equilibria, this is where you really discover the special structure in your game, like a routing game with linear comp functions. You discover the structure which leads you to really good small constant price of anarchy bounds. All of that action tends to already happen in this special case. So this is the fun, and this is much simpler than proving bounds over here. So wouldn't it be great if someone handed to us on a silver platter an extension theorem which said, look, as the analyst, all you're responsible for is proving a bound in the easy special, relatively easy special case of Nash equilibria, and you can use this extension theorem to extend in a black box way whatever approximation bound you prove here to the more general equilibrium concept, which is what you want to claim in your theorem. So you want to work hard only for pure Nash equilibria and then have a hammer, this extension theorem, that gives you the same conclusion for the much, much bigger sense. That's sort of the analyst's dream. The reason it's a dream is because it obviates both of the reasons why trying to directly prove bounds about general equilibrium classes might be uh, sort of a dispiriting activity. The first reason is just a lot more work as an analyst than for pure Nash equilibria. The second reason is like you're sort of worried that, as we said, you know, you enlarge the set of equilibria, maybe your approximation bound goes out the window. You thought you had a cool result, you proved a factor of two for pure Nash equilibria, but then it turns into a factor of a thousand when you look at these more general equilibrium concepts. So if an extension theorem exists, it dodges both of these problems by definition. That you don't have to do any work to get the extension, and the approximation guarantee remains exactly the same. So it's fine to daydream about the existence of an extension theorem. Probably seems a little bit too good to be true. And indeed, in full generality, it absolutely is too good to be true. It's not difficult to exhibit games where, say, mixed Nash equilibria are just fundamentally worse than the pure Nash equilibria. And when you have game, when you have a separation between the equilibrium concepts like that, when there, there's not going to be a lossless extension theorem. So the question then is, is there any conditions under which you can salvage an extension theorem? And when I take, you know, conditions under which you can, you know, have an extension theorem, maybe you think, oh, special, special domains, you know, special uh, assumptions on the payoffs and so on. So it turns out to be the really key idea in enabling an extension theorem is to place a restriction, to place an assumption on the manner by which you prove a price of anarchy bound for pure Nash equilibrium. So we're going to have an extension theorem which works for certain types of proofs of bounds for pure Nash equilibria. So if you tell me you prove a factor two for pure Nash equilibria, it's going to depend. If it's the kind of proof that I like, it'll extend automatically to the more general sets. If it doesn't conform to a template, then it won't extend. So what do I mean when I say most known price of energy bounds extend to all of these bigger sets of equilibria? Well, so the first thing is, just like I said, and I'll formulate this precisely in a minute, we're going to have an extension theorem which automatically extends without loss certain types of price of energy bounds for pure Nash equilibria all the way out to the biggest sets. So there is an extension theorem that applies under certain conditions on the proof that you used for the smallest set. Now, the second, now this would not be interesting if the hypotheses of this extension theorem were never met. If nobody ever proved the price of energy bounds in this restricted way, you could never apply this extension theorem. Happily, if you go to the literature and you look at most of the, well, the most well-known price of energy bounds, 
one discovers they either immediately meet the hypotheses of this extension theorem or can be easily recast as such. So when I say most known results, what I really mean is, you know, two thirds or more of the price of energy bounds that are out there in the world actually are proved in a way conforming to a template that I'll show you in a second for which this extension theorem holds. So the extension theorem holds always for a certain class of proofs and say 70% of the proofs that people have ever done fall into this class, okay? So what I owe you next, and I'm gonna give you more details on, is you know, what do I really mean by this extension theorem? What does it mean to restrict the type, the way in which you prove an approximation bound for pure Nash equilibria? So that's what's coming up next. Any questions before then? Okay, if not, let me tell you exactly what I mean by proving a bound on the pure Nash equilibrium of the game in a prescribed way. Let me tell you the prescription. So it's gonna be clearest to talk about this at a relatively high level of abstraction. So let me introduce some notation for games, but again, just think about routing games as the canonical special case, even though there's other domains to which this general theory applies. So there's a bunch of, you know, there's some players and players say, uh, you know, in general, you're just picking some strategy SI. Think of SI as just a single path in a network. This bold S, this denotes a strategy profile. So for a routing game, that's just a traffic pattern. And this just denotes the cost, so travel time, say, that player I experiences in this particular outcome, in this particular traffic pattern. Okay? And just like in the example, my assumption is that an altruistic dictator or the system designer wants to maximize welfare or equivalently minimize the joint cost. So let's imagine that, you know, we have a homework assignment to do. We have, to, we have, you know, some game like this, and we need to prove that the price of energy for pure equilibria is at most a factor two. That's our job. So what would such a proof look like? Well, you know, let's just follow our notes, okay? So we have to prove some down on every Nash equilibrium. So we start with an arbitrary Nash equilibrium, call it S. And we have to prove this is not too much more expensive than optimal. So let's give optimal a name. We'll call that S star. Okay, so this is an equilibrium traffic pattern. This is the best one that a centralized designer would choose. So we start with just the equilibrium cost. And now what we want is we want some inequalities. So we want uh, you know, quantities that only get larger and larger. And we want that to terminate in the conclusion of twice times the optimal cost. That's the kind of proof that we're looking for algebraically. Now, at the current level of abstraction, we have very few things going for us. Like sort of the only assumption that's on this slide is that we're starting from a Nash equilibrium. So we obviously have to use this hypothesis in our proof. What does it mean to be at a Nash equilibrium? It means if anyone switches, their cost only goes up, right? They only get worse. So the way we can use that, we can invoke the Nash equilibrium hypothesis very generically, is we take the equilibrium cost, you know, we expand it as a sum over the players. And now, you know, we pick our favorite player I, and we say, well, you know, if player I switches from what it's doing in the equilibrium to anything else, it only gets worse. And so that's good, right? Because we, we want inequalities with quantities that are only going up. So any deviation by any player from this, whoops, from this state will lead to an only larger quantity. So, you know, that sort of suggests the question, all right, so I'm gonna invoke the Nash equilibrium hypothesis with some hypothetical deviation. What deviation should I use? I mean, in principle, there's some creativity in figuring out how to use the Nash equilibrium hypothesis. You know, but there's only kind of one other thing even on the slide. There's, you know, I only have the, you know, the, all, the only other thing kind of in the room is this optimal strategy S star. So in some sense, the only thing you can do at the beginning of this proof is apply the Nash equilibrium hypothesis once to each of these N players saying, hey, player I, how come you're not doing what I want you to do in the optimal solution? How come you're not playing S star I? Why aren't you doing this? And the reason is, S was a Nash equilibrium, if player I switched unilaterally to S star I, its cost would only go up. So if we apply the, the equilibrium condition n times, once per player, with, these, with S star supplying the hypothetical deviations, we get this first inequality. And that's a canonical way to apply the Nash equilibrium hypothesis in a price of anarchy proof. Okay? Now, what do we do next? What would the next step in a price of anarchy proof look like? Well, you know, this quantity that we've just derived, we do not care about these numbers at all. This has no semantics for us. This is just some weird entangled version of the optimal and the equilibrium outcomes, right? So we don't care about this, except in as much 
as we can relate this quantity to the only two quantities that we actually do care about, namely the cost of an equilibrium and the cost of an optimal solution. So what I'm, what I'm saying is the rest of a price of energy proof has to be relating this to the costs of S and S star. That's what it looks like. So it's going to be an inequality like star. If you prove a bound in the price of energy, essentially you have no choice but to relate where we terminated the previous proof and relate it back to these two costs. Now, I'm going to just go ahead and assume that we relate it using a linear combination of the two costs because it turns out I can get away with restricting attention to linear combinations. Okay? Now, here's the point. Suppose that we proved this inequality star. Or I should say lambda and mu here are certain parameters. So lambda, think of lambda as like two. Think of mu as like one half. Exactly what those parameters are are going to depend on the application domain. Different games will give you different values of the parameters. But suppose you prove star for some settings of the parameters of lambda and mu. Then we can finish the proof and we can actually bound the quality of every single Nash equilibrium. How do we do that? Well, this first inequality came from the last slide. We said by using the Nash equilibrium hypothesis, we can bound the equilibrium cost by this weird entangled quantity. And if we've proven star, we can just invoke that here. And we say, OK, well, the equilibrium cost is the most lambda times the optimal cost plus mu times the equilibrium cost. Provided mu is less than 1, we can subtract this term from both sides and divide. And we find that the cost of S is no more than lambda over 1 minus mu times the optimal cost. So if lambda was 2 and mu was 1 half, this would prove that every pure Nash equilibrium has a cost no more than four times that of an optimal solution. Okay? So the key takeaway from what I've just shown you is that, you know, price of energy bounds, at least intuitively, have a very kind of canonical template, a canonical form. And the key game-specific part of that proof is you have to prove inequality of the form star for Nash equilibria of the game. So that's generally what price of energy proofs look like. Now, what I owe you is the extra restriction I'm going to impose on these proofs so that I get this automatic extension, not just to Nash equilibria, but all the way out to those much bigger, much more tractable sets of equilibria. So here is, was there a question? Okay. No. okay. So here is the extra condition that I'm going to insist upon. Okay. And the def, you know, and the, the pro, if you, okay. So here is the extra property that's required. So I want you to prove this inequality star, not just for the Nash equilibria S of the game, but in fact, for all equilibria of the game. This is the stronger price of energy proof that's going to enable an extension theorem. So let me back up and say everything formally. Okay? So the formal definition is that of a game being smooth. And smooth has these two parameters, lambda and mu. You may or may not be able to prove a game is smooth for a given setting of these parameters. What it means for a game to be smooth is that for every pair of outcomes S and S star, again, equilibria or not, for every pair of outcomes S and S star, you are responsible for proving that this entangled version of S and S star can be bounded above by a linear combination of S star's cost and S's cost, where lambda and mu are the coefficients in that linear combination. If a game is smooth, then by this two inequality argument, it is the case, it's a sufficient condition for the price of energy of pure Nash equilibria to be at most lambda over 1 minus mu. I will show you later that if a game is smooth, not only are the pure equilibria within a factor of lambda one over one minus mu, as we see on this slide, but in fact, so are those more general equilibrium concepts discussed earlier. But that is not obvious. I owe you a proof for that. What I do hope you understand at this point is that smoothness is a sufficient condition to bound the quality of pure Nash equilibria. Maybe a stupid question. Yep. What if your optimal solution has a zero cost? Does that apply to the application? Yeah, so, what it, so if the optimal solution has zero cost, then you're not going to be able to prove this with any reasonable parameters of lambda and mu. Yeah. So let me point out that there's, there's sort of two things going on. So, so the first thing is, even if you just, if you forgetting about these more general concepts, even just for pure Nash equilibria, 
there's, it's, it, there's certainly classes of games where pure Nash equilibria are terrible. So, for example, even if you, like, we talked about how in routing games, if you keep the link utilization low, like at most 90%, then the price of anarchy is at most two. If you let the link utilization approach 100%, the price of anarchy in the worst case in those games approaches infinity. Okay, so definitely there will be games where even for pure Nash equilibria, you will have terrible equilibria. Um, so the point of this extension theorem is sort of predicated on the idea that you're working with a model where at least the pure Nash equilibria are good. And this lets you conclude, well, if the pure Nash equilibria are good, then so are all of these much more tractable equilibria as well. But as I said, I mean, what, what lambda and mu you can actually establish definitely depends on the game. Other questions? Okay, so these were, uh, there aren't a whole lot of technical slides in the talk, so these are two of the most technical slides that we just got through. So again, you know, the high order bits, I've uh, defined the notion of a game being smooth with Tramers, Lambda, and Mu. This slide shows that that's a sufficient condition for the pure Nash equilibria to be near optimal with a factor Lambda over one minus Mu. I will show you later, it's actually a sufficient condition for those more general equilibrium concepts to be within that factor of optimal as well. So proving star for all outcomes S, not just for equilibria, is what enables the extension theorem, as we'll see. Okay. So uh, that's, that's drilling down in part one of the template we had before. So that's what I mean by a restricted type of price of energy proof. I mean, you actually establish the smoothness condition and then part two was, you know, lots of the literature actually does prove this stronger property. So they were, people were basically in, inadvertently meeting this definition. And as we'll see, that enables these automatic extensions. So here's an incomplete list of bounds from the literature, uh, which do in fact uh, correspond to smoothness bounds. And so to which the, uh, the um, extension theorem to come does apply. You might be wondering, you know, what does a smoothness proof look like? Uh, so let me just kind of flash uh, a canonical one by Christoudelou and Kutsupius. So I, let me just put this up here. I, 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 the point here is not to follow the algebra. That's not the point at all. The point is just to, uh, you know, say, you know, what does a smoothness proof look like? Two properties they usually have, you know, so first of all, you know, they're kind of elementary in the sense that uh, you know, you're, you're massaging a lot of inequalities. But the second point is, you know, they're not trivial. I mean, these magic, uh, you know, price of energy numbers of, you know, 2.5 or four thirds or whatever, you know, those constants have to come out from some sort of non-trivial optimization. Uh, and so this is the kind of uh, smoothness proofs that you might see. So they're, they're, you know, once you come up with them, they're very easy to model check, uh, but they're not necessarily that easy to come up with, at least for the optimal values of parameters lambda and mu. That said, the, the proofs are so formulaic, in some cases, researchers have even been able to just numerically search for the optimal values of lambda and mu that they can then plug into their proof, okay? But again, this, it's in the smoothness proof and figuring out what are the right values of lambda and mu, that's where you really understand what's special about your game. This is where the special payoff function structure of your game plays an absolutely critical role is in figuring out what are the right values of lambda and mu. Okay, so now let me actually prove for you that if a game is smooth, that is, if it, if it satisfies that, that star inequality, not just for Nash equilibria, but for all outcomes of the game, then that's a sufficient condition, not just for Nash equilibria to be near optimal, but all of the other equilibria that we talked about as well. And so in particular, I'm going to prove that smooth games, uh, no regret sequences, which I'll define on the next slide, no regret sequences, I have an approximation factor, which is exactly the same as what we got for pure Nash equilibria. So just as one concrete example, I should have said, so on slide two, we talked about routing games with affine cost functions. So the, the, uh, the work of Chris Tudelow and Kutsupia shows that that family of games, routing games with affine cost functions, is indeed smooth with parameters five-thirds and one-third. So that in particular implies that the worst case price of energy in that class of games is at most 2.5, it's at most five halves. Now, originally that was proven just for pure Nash equilibria. A special case of this extension theorem says that that magic number of 2.5 holds for all of the other sets as well. 
So I'm going to prove this theorem now. And of course, to do that, I need to finally actually tell you, I need to finally define these uh, more permissive equilibrium concepts. So let me define for you a no regret sequence of a game. So what I want to think about now is, is a game played repeatedly over time. So think of it as a fixed network, like it's a fixed traffic network, and we just observe, uh, you know, it's the same set of commuters. We look at morning uh, rush hour traffic at the same time every day for 100 days in a row. So we get 100 traffic patterns all residing in exactly the same network. So that's the sequence of outcomes in a fixed game. So we call this sequence no regret or with vanishing regret if the following guarantee holds for each player I. Basically, each player I should satisfy a time averaged version of the Nash equilibrium uh, condition. So what do I mean formally? I mean, well, for a given player I, look at the average, the time average cost that it incurred over this sequence of outcomes. So you drove to work every day for 100 days. Just look at the average time it took you to get to work. That's the left hand side. And I want to say that that's not too big. And the, com the competitors are time invariant strategies. So for every fixed deviation Q sub I, so this would be like you take exactly the same route to work every single day on all 100 days, the time average performance of every time invariant strategy should be at least as large, up to a vanishing error term, as the time average time experienced by this player. Okay? So that is what we mean when we say a sequence with no regret. Every player has time average cost, no worse up to a small error factor than uh, the best time average cost of a time invariant strategy. So if you've never seen this before, you may not have a strong sense of you know, how strong an assumption this is. You know, if you take a pure Nash equilibrium and you just play it every single day, that's clearly one example. But if you haven't seen this before, just you know, take it on faith that there are many, many more no regret sequences than merely Nash equilibria. So for example, if you know about correlated equilibria, they can certainly all be simulated by sequences that meet this condition. In fact, this is an even strictly more, a strictly weaker notion than correlated equilibria. And even better, very simple reinforcement learning style algorithms will guarantee this condition for a player. So strategies going back to Blackwell and Fanon, and from the computer science side, one well-known example would be uh, Freund Shapira or Litterstone's Warmoth. They have things like multiplicative weights, hedge, and perceptron. So now what I want to do is let's assume we have a smooth game. Let's assume the game is played repeatedly and we get a no regret outcome. Then this no regret outcome is close to optimal. That's what I'm going to prove. The proof takes only one slide. So we have our no regret sequence, you know, our 100 traffic patterns, S1 through ST. The game is fixed, so the optimal solution is fixed. Call it a star as before. Let me go ahead and multiply out by the capital T, and let's, let's not worry about that. So let's look at the total joint cost endured by the players over this entire sequence. So again, we're going to basically try to mimic our previous derivation for Nash equilibria. So I'll just use the fact that you know, the objective function is just the joint cost of the players, so I have a sum over the players. And now this is where it seems like we get stuck relative to our previous deviation. When we were talking about Nash equilibria, what did we use? We said, well, if a player deviated at a Nash equilibrium, it can only get worse. But the key thing to realize is on this slide, we are not assuming that anything's a Nash equilibria. All we have is a global condition on this whole sequence. We know essentially nothing about any of these individual outcomes. In particular, these individual outcomes are certainly not Nash equilibrium in general. So when we hypothesize, when we ponder a player switching strategies, it cost might well get better. It might well drop. So that's what's different with respect to the previous deviation, uh, derivation. So let's defer the issue with some notation. So let's just, again, think about walking up to player I on day T and insisting that it switches to its strategy S star I in the optimal solution. Its cost might go up or it might go down. So let's let delta IT denote the drop in player I's cost if it switches to the optimal strategy S star I on day T. Okay? So that's how much it gets better if it follows this recommended deviation. So this was always non-positive in the Nash equilibrium case. Now this can be strictly positive because these are not Nash equilibrium in general. So the plan is we're just going to use the smoothness hypothesis to control these entangled terms, and we're going to use the no regret assumption to control the deltas. 
Specifically, recall the form of the smoothness definition was that these weird entangled terms that we don't care about, we can always upper bound with a suitable linear combination of the separate costs. And remember, the whole point of smoothness was to insist that we could do that charging, we could do that disentangling, no matter what the pair of outcomes are, equilibria or not. So that's what we're using because these indeed are not in general equilibria. So smoothness says we can upper bound this by the suitable linear combination of the S star cost and the cost of the players at time T. Now, so that's one, that's one hypothesis. Now let's collect all of these error terms, these deltas together. Okay, so we have a sum over I and T of the delta IT. Let's sum first over the players. So let's think about a fixed player and then think about this inner sum. Okay, so for a fixed player I, the sum of the delta IT is over T. Let's recall the semantics of delta IT. What does it mean? It means if we walk up to player I on day T, force it to switch to S star I, it's how much its cost drops. So what's the semantics of this sum over all T? Well, that says, what if we walk up to player I every single day, and every day we make it switch to the time invariance optimal strategy as star i. Well, that's exactly what the no regret hypothesis gives us control over. No regret by assumption says the time average cost of a player in the sequence S1 to S capital T is no more than the average cost of any time invariant strategy like playing S star i every single day. But differently, what no regret tells us is that while indeed certain delta ITs might well be positive, for each fixed i, if we sum over the days t, this inner sum is non-positive. And for that reason, we can ignore the collection of error terms. We conclude just by rearranging and dividing through as before. So again, summarizing, assuming that a game is smooth, that is assuming that we prove that disentangling inequality for all outcomes s, we conclude that not merely pure equilibria have an approximation factor of lambda over one minus mu, but so indeed everything in the biggest set, no regret sequence. Any questions about that? Okay. All right, so we're done with uh, the, the, the sort of uh, the proof type slides. Let me just, uh, I wanna make a sort of collection of comments in my final 10 minutes. So first, just two quick sound bites about senses in which the work I've described so far is tight, is best possible. So the first thing is, you know, in research, you always want to be greedy. Right? You prove a theorem, you immediately say, oh, maybe we can have a better theorem. So you just prove the theorem saying that we get this good approximation down for everything in this, you know, big set of no regret sequences. But why not shoot for an even bigger set than that? You know, why not be greedy? So there is sort of a slightly bigger set that this exact same proof works for, which is in this final inequality, what did I prove? I proved that for every single player, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, we use the fact that for each player, uh, the regret was non-negative, so that this overall sum was non-positive. And we proved it player by player. Obviously, this exact same proof would hold if we just assumed that this entire double sum was non-positive. So that is, it's okay for some players to have regret as long as they're canceled out by other players that have negative regret. Mm -hmm. So that's an obvious optimization. And you can actually prove, using a convex duality argument, that that is the biggest set for which smoothness uh, approximation bounds hold. You cannot go back beyond this very uh, minor generalization of no regret sequences. So really, you know, in some sense, uh, smoothness arguments can be thought of as a sort of primal solutions, uh, and these no regret sequences can be thought of as sort of matching dual solutions, and they're really made for each other. They really are, uh, smoothness arguments are really fundamentally about this outermost set of no regret sequences cannot do better, you cannot have a bigger set. And you're saying internal regret is good enough, I guess. Internal regret would be even stronger, that's right. So internal regret would get you in the correlated equilibrium right. set. That's right. So, you know, if you're happy having, you know, if you're, if you're comfortable with that hypothesis, you're completely golden with, with uh, smoothness proofs. And in fact, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a very prescient question because just in the last couple of years, I'm not going to have time to talk about this. Um, you know, but so the smoothness definition is now about four years old. So there's been a bunch of extensions and variants since then. And mm -hmm. there's two different extensions, one by myself and Florian Shopman, one by Ava Tardos and Vasilis Serganis, who both uh, basically, uh, you know, we, you know, um, it's, it's, a, it's a relaxed definition of smoothness. It does not ask for as much, 
-hmm. and the conclusion is weaker, and you actually get these land over one minus mu bounds, you do not get them for the neural regret set, but you do get them for the correlated equilibrium. Okay. So in some sense, you can push this theory even further if you're willing to give up on the neural regret sequences and you're happy to have no internal regret. Okay. So that's actually wound up being a really kind of interesting distinction just in the, in the, in the most recent uh, kind of papers on these topics. Okay, so another sense in which uh, smoothness bounds, smoothness arguments can be tight. So here's something you might be worried about, right? So, you know, maybe you have a class of games that, you know, you really care about, you know, so you have your favorite application domain, and maybe you have good reasons to worry only about pure Nash equilibrium. You know, maybe there's like a potential game, and you're perfectly comfortable assuming the games that are pure Nash equilibrium. Then it kind of seems like these smoothness proofs are total overkill, right? It's way too blunt an instrument. But if you can if you can find yourself to smoothness proofs, whether you want to or not, you're going to inadvertently get bounds that apply to everything here. They're going to apply to no regret sequences, whether you want it or not. So you might think that departing from the smoothness paradigm and using a finer grain argument would permit sharper bounds just on the smallest set of say pure Nash equilibria. One thing you can prove, and this is not true across all application domains, but something which is true for routing games is that smoothness proofs can be, without loss of generality, used. You cannot actually prove better bounds, even for just pure equilibria, than what you can prove using a smoothness argument. Put differently, show me any bound, upper bound, on the price of energy of pure equilibria, I will show you parameters, lambda and mu, and a valid smoothness proof with those parameters so that my bound lambda over one minus mu is at least as good as yours. So this is the intrinsic robustness of congestion games. Every price of energy bound automatically extends to neural regret sequences, whether you care about them or not. But differently, you lose nothing by confining attention to smoothness proofs in this particular domain. All right, so let me uh, wrap up with maybe five minutes about games of incomplete information and a much a more recent extension theorem that has been proved for them. Uh, so let me sort of introduce you to the idea with an analogous cartoon that we had before. So remember, when I motivated extension theorems, I said it's a tool for the lazy analyst. You'd love to just worry about pure Nash equilibrium of your game, but yet get your conclusions for, you know, much more general sets like coarse correlated equilibria. Now, in a game of incomplete information, think about something like an auction, right? So if you're participating in an auction, in general, you don't know what, the other, what your competitors are willing to pay for the goods for sale. So it's not a complete information game. You do not know the preferences of the other people. You do not know the maximum that they'd be willing to pay. So the point is, is you have two sources of uncertainty in a game of incomplete information. You have, an, you have uncertainty about what players, what actions they're taking. They might be randomizing over strategies, just like before. But there's also uncertainty in what they want, in their preferences. So that said, these are important classes of applications, and we'd like to think about their equilibria. And the canonical equilibrium notion there is called Bayes' Nash equilibrium. But again, now things are even hairier to think about, right? So now you don't, you have these two sources of randomness, you have to have a prior over people's preferences and so on. And again, as the analyst, the lazy analyst, you're like, man, I really wish I could just pretend like the preferences were totally known. That is, I really wish I could just sort of condition on everybody's private information that would turn this game into one of complete information. So for example, I want to imagine that I have you know, uh, telepathy and I know what everybody's willing to pay in some auction. And then moreover, I want to just analyze the pure equilibria in the induced game of complete information. So this is the same thing we were talking about before. Complete information games, everybody knows everybody's payoffs, pure and actual equilibria. So we'd love to have an even stronger extension theorem which says, for any corresponding incomplete information game, any mixed Bayes-Nash equilibria in that incomplete information game. So again, for example, you know, the equilibria of a first or of many first price auctions with respect to some prior, we'd love to have whatever bound we proved in this simple special case to extend without loss all the way out to the incomplete information setting. And uh, there are there is an extension theorem that's more general in this sense. So this is a recent result of mine. It was also uh, proved independently slightly later by Vasilis Sirganis, a student at Cornell. And so you can define a notion of a game of a smooth game of incomplete information, which more or less says that however you condition on players' preferences, 
and that gives you a game of complete information. So no matter what players' types are, that complete information game is land and use smooth. That's roughly the definition. Then, in every corresponding incomplete information game, every mixed phase Nash equilibrium has approximation factor lambda over 1 minus mu. Now, I owe you a little explanation when I say, what do I mean by every corresponding game of incomplete information? So the difference between the complete information game and the incomplete information game is in the incomplete information game, you have a prior. So there's a commonly known distribution over the payoffs of all of the players. And so, so what's missing, the missing ingredient to make it an incomplete information game is this prior distribution. And what this extension theorem is built for, it's built for approximation bounds that hold no matter what the prior distribution is for every single prior. I don't care if it's uniform, I don't care if it's Gaussian, I don't care if it's exponential, whatever. No matter what the prior is, you get the approximation then of lambda over one minus mu. There is, however, one catch. The extension theorem requires that players types, so if you like what players are willing to pay in some auction, they should be stochastically independent. That is, the extension theorem works only for product distributions over players' private information. But under that assumption on the prior and nothing else, just independence, it doesn't need IID, it doesn't need any kind of uh, assumptions about the shapes of the distributions, you get an extension theorem. The proof definitely doesn't fit on a slide. Uh, one reason we sort of know the proof of this extension theorem has to be uh, more complicated than that for the complete information case is because it doesn't hold for correlated types. So we have to crucially use the independence of players' private information in the proof, and indeed the proof for that reason uh, is significantly more complex. I'm not going to talk about it here. There are also counterexamples saying that there are not lossless extension theorems for correlated types except in rather special cases, although some interesting applications including uh, sponsored search auctions. So wrapping up what have I told you about, so I've pointed out how there's a canonical way to think about bounding the price of anarchy of pure equilibria. And if you strengthen the canonical way in a certain way, and that's the definition of a smooth game, then it becomes a sufficient condition not just for bounds on Nash equilibria, but well beyond Nash equilibria. We talked mostly about the complete information case, applications to correlated equilibria, no regret sequences, but there are also recent extension theorems for Bayes and Nash equilibria uh, in games of incomplete information. We talked a little bit about the tightness of the results. At least for routing games, you provably cannot do better than what you can prove using smoothness arguments. So I'll stop there. Thanks a lot for your attention.